Um, tonight, we are happy to have the opportunity to hear from the um, collective of John, Sh of, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do this, Jeff Shore and John Fisher. <laughs> They're not interchangeable. Um, Shore Fisher started their collaborative practice in 2002 with Jeff developing the visual aspects and John the auditory. Um, they have an interesting exhibition record including solo exhibitions at um, the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver which I can totally imagine their work there, um, the Blaffer Art Museum satellite space, and um, both the Clementine and Derek Eller galleries in New York. Of the Clementine show, Real to Real, they received a write-up in the New York Times describing them as two talented Texas artists who make their New York debut with an elaborate kinetic electric video installation, dot, 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 which is a little like being in a 21st century music box that has its own movie screen. So you're intrigued, right? The work of Shore Fisher is in fact magical, but in a how did they do that and who cares, it's amazing way. Um, I had the pleasure of encountering their work last fall at Tinsel Strength, an exhibition for Sculpture Month Houston at Site Gallery of the Silos um, at Sawyer Yards. Um, when I did, I hoped that I could share it with you through the Tuesday evening presentations. Thanks to John and Jeff accepting my invitation, that hope is about to be fulfilled. So if you would, let's get started by showing our appreciation for them saying yes with um, a warm, warm welcome for John Fisher and Jeff Short. Uh, good evening, and uh, just in case you don't know who is who, I am John Fisher. This is Jeff Shulman. Um, it's easy to get us mixed up sometimes. Uh, and we'd just like to say thanks to Terry and to the museum for inviting us uh, here to talk. Um, and I think what we'd like to do is give you what I would call a whirlwind tour of uh, what we've been doing over the last two decades. Um, we've kind of uh, had a long-running collaboration, and it's developed uh, over the years, and so Hopefully we can see some of the common threads and some of the things we've been uh, doing and how we've changed over the years. Um, th so the, the way we're going to try to present this, our, our work is such that you really can't get a sense of it without seeing some video, at least some video documentation of it. So we've, we've got a lot of uh, clips, very short clips that we're going to be talking about and showing um, from pieces started back, starting back around 2002 all the way up to this last uh, fall. Um, before we get into those clips, though, uh, we want to just give you a little bit of our history before uh, 2002 so you can sort of understand how we got to the point um, where we made the piece that we're going to show as the first, the first clip. Okay. So Jeff might take it. So we both grew up in Seabrook, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. Um, we went to school together starting in fifth grade. By ninth grade, we were best friends. Um, our relationship was always based on collaborative projects, so we made music together, we refurbished a boat and went sailing together, we camping, we did many things, but we, one of the things we did was we, we sort of fantasized about a hybrid art form between music and visual art. And this was as we were approaching college. And yeah, I mean, I was, I was a musician and Jeff was interested in art from, you know, early on, and um, we had these ideas that were not very well formed about how we would put these two things together. And it never, it didn't work at all, our ideas that we had in, in high school. Yeah, I mean, they're just silly, but, but we had the idea. So, so John decided to go to North Texas to pursue studies in music, and I just followed him, and actually was very pleased to find a great program at that time for my undergraduate. And so this was in the late 80s, and so. Early 90s, so I studied music composition, Jeff was studying. Uh, yeah, I was in the painting program, but by the fourth year, I quit painting, and I started making sculpture. And we still had these ideas of uh, we wanted to put these two things together, but we just did not have the, we didn't have what it, we what it, we needed really to be able to do yeah, that. Yeah, and I think we, at, at that point in the way we learned about our practices, historically we were kind of separated. It was like we did, we lost the dialogue that we had in high school. So after we graduated, I went back to Seabrook to kind of collect myself. I hoped to get into the core program in in, in Houston. I was on the short list, but didn't make it in. And John went on to. So I went on to do some graduate school work in uh, uh, Northwestern, at Northwestern, uh, north of Chicago and Evanston. And um, so this, this period in the early 90s was 
sort of, uh, I think, kind of important for both of us, so even though we weren't necessarily working together. But um, a couple of things happened to me in Chicago. I got access to some computers that could do some sound processing and sound mixing, which was not very common at the, at the time in the early 90s. So I started to get interested in using computers and electronics to, uh, to make music. Um, and also around that time, though, uh, so, so Jeff and I were separated by a pretty large distance, but um, he, he came to visit me a couple of times, and again, our friendship had already, always been project-based, and so he, he flew up to Chicago just uh, with the purpose right. of... Right, I think in 93 and 94, it was like, I wasn't sure what I was doing with myself. I was experimenting in the city. I wasn't really hooked into the art scene in Houston yet, but I had this, this idea of this hybrid form. I mean, we came and we constructed some crazy automatic device that played music by water and... Yeah, so this was in, 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 in my backyard, no venue except for my house. And, uh, but interestingly enough, it, um, it turned out to have almost all of the elements that a lot of our work has and that you'll be seeing today. And but very crude. Extremely crude, and we, we probably have some old video of it uh, somewhere. But um, so, so, the, so there, was the, there were these early projects that we did. We did another a film project when Jeff got a hold of a video camera, and um, I started to use computers to generate music to put together with his video imagery. So we, so we started to come back around from the other side to put these things together, not even, maybe not even realizing at the time that we were starting to do uh, what we had always wanted to do. Right, but this was comfortable because in high school, we kind of considered ourselves a band. We always made music together. We, you know, would hang out, come up with ideas, and, and this was just like a continuation of. Yeah. So, so by the late, or mid, uh, the mid to late 90s is when things really started to be able to come together. Uh, for me, the big change was I got a job at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, and uh, they asked me to teach a programming class um, that I was completely unqualified for, and I said, yeah, okay. And uh, then I learned how to program pretty quickly. Um, also, while I was there, I learned a lot about electronics, and this perfectly co coincided with a time when, when Jeff had started to uh, show some of his installations in Houston, and he started having a need. Right. So uh, between, I guess, 92 and 94, I had this big questioning of what I was going to do in my studio. I did these experiments. I didn't want to get a job. I went back to grad school for one semester and decided I didn't want to do that. Dropped out, um, tried to get involved in the Houston art community. We're doing art handling and then getting as many shows as possible and, and with this continuing conversation of this experiment that we want to do together. And, and I started developing an installation practice that was getting me invited to a lot of shows. So it was just an um, interactive, electromechanical. Uh, anyway, it got to a point where I needed technical assistance to really explore, explore it further. Yeah, so um, unfortunately we don't have time to show any of those early pieces or really talk about them. We're just much, trying to give much, context to where we're going to Much detail, but uh, yeah, so, so for, for example, Jeff had this idea of having um, 100 metronomes ticking at different speeds in one of his installations, and I had learned enough about electronics that I was like, I think... They showed up in the mail one day. <laughs> <laughs> so so, and so, we, so we started the relationship like that, but um, pretty quickly we started doing more and more uh, work together. Um, we started calling the collaboration Jeff Shore with John Fisher because I was basically joining into his... Right, his, and I was getting invited to practice. do nice shows. I mean, we were showing museums and galleries and... Yeah, so that's late 90s, very early 2000s. And so we're getting up to this point that we're going to start showing you the clips. And um, I think that I think in the New Orleans Triennial, it was really obvious to me that we had to change the to make it an official collaboration because instead of being Jeff Shore with John Fisher, as it had been the few installations before, it was Jeff Shore, and then in the materials list on the label, John's name appeared. I was a material collection. <laughs> so. Not to mention my name was spelled, misspelled uh, <laughs> most of the time. That's okay. So, so uh, what, what that brought us to was um, we kind of decided, let, let's start you know, as equal collaborators and try to make a series of, of pieces as experiments to see what we can really do now that we have sort of... To try to make our technologies seem inseparable. We had started yeah. developing a language together. And so, so one, of, one of the threads that runs through these pieces is we, we're always trying to, to develop something that's somewhat performative um, and that seems to have a life of its own, but also that, that combines sound with visual imagery in a way that they're not, that they're completely um, part of the same thing. They're, they're, 
they're but, correlated and interconnected. They're, there's not there's not just background music for one of Jeff's pretty objects. It's it's that the sound and the visuals are one and that one like thing. music that you have to spend time with it for to understand it fully. So it reveals it. It has to do with time and ha yeah, in your experience with it. So yeah. So let's start with the first okay. clip. The first the first piece we're going to show is from 2002. It was called Moving in Stereo. Um, Number one, we actually did four or five of these. Uh, right, these and so in in this, we made a darkened theater instead of a bright lit gallery. I hung, um, it was three three wall hung boxes where paintings would be. When we started the installation, the lights would dim, and these would perform for you. So here's so one. Here we go. Those, they were like strange lanterns that have a puppet show. You know, the, yeah. they're actually stretched scrims that appear to be solid objects, but then when the lights change and the lights reverse, then you see that they, they offer this. It, and for me, this opportunity was great because I was having I was having trouble finding a context to to using you know music like this that I could generate with a computer that I could you know use found samples or record my samples of my own instruments and. And manipulate them. Um, it never made sense in music school to play these things to a, a darkened uh, room with an empty stage where a performer should be. Uh, and Jeff provided this performer, and suddenly I had a, a, a reason to make this music. That and made and a aesthetically, lot more sense these things aren't polished. I mean, they, this this is a, the skin on that was actually stretched shower curtains. I mean, it was all just materials I can get at like the dollar store. But it was more about what it did once it was on. So yeah. So the next year, we made a, a fairly more, a more ambitious piece called Live Feed, um, which is a larger scale installation of... Uh, it's a network of four of these boxes, but the boxes turned to plexiglass. Instead of having just a shadow scene inside, they actually have scale models that are watched by live cameras. <laughs> right. So there's a number of things that are changing here. So Jeff is, Jeff is going to cameras to give you a, a view inside his sculptures. Um, there's also uh, another one of the long-running things that go through our work is I, I like to try to create automated instruments um, that are actual physical, have a physical presence in the installation as well as, you know, using the computer-generated sound and things like that. Um, and so the first thing you'll see in, in this clip is um, three drums, which are automated and controlled by the, the installation, basically, that, that started off. And then um, the, the clip shows a little bit of each one of the scenes that are that's generated from this uh, installation.
So, you know, I, I kind of thought to get people involved at that time, if I parked a television at eye level right next to my piece, watching what's going on inside, it might, it, it, anyway. So there's my hook. One, one comment people had after seeing that installation was, you know, they noticed, well, there's no people in any of these scenes. There's, there's an airplane, there's no people in there. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, so a TV. there's a reality that I can't make little people that really look that good on <laughs> video, but um, so the, it inspired me to try to do something to bring the human in, so we did sort of a comical. So the next piece is uh, from the next year, 2004. It's called Talking Head. Voice activated. not only voice activated, it was voice sampling. He yeah, was it was an experiment we did with a voice sampling chip that um, it, it, it could keep a history of maybe 10 of the last activations that, that people made. So if you had a bunch of different people who would go up, every, every time someone activates it with their voice, it would save that sample and then integrate that into the soundtrack along with some other sounds. And so uh, that was just one, it was sort of an attempt on, for one thing to, to make the sound is always going to be different because part of it is coming from the actual activation. Um, so we're always trying to find a way to give these things a little bit more of their, a life of their own rather than, um, the last thing I want, I want something to sound like from my perspective is, you know, a recording. Right. Oh, so the, the sand pieces are next, right? Yeah, sand, uh, sand timer bathroom is the next piece okay. we're gonna yeah, show. Yeah. So we did a series of sand pieces where I figured out how to vibrate sand and make it look like it's animated inside my scenes. And so that was my, answer to trying to make it look like there's life. Yeah, so, so it looks like uh, uh, stop, animation. St stop animation, but um, it's actually a live camera shot, so here it is. <laughs> called those pieces sand timer pieces because they had two compartments and they'd pass the sand back and forth. And so for something different, um, the next piece is called Grass Growing Machine in which uh, we literally- Again, they're in putting life back in there, but this one very <laughs> slow growing life. Yeah, so it's literally, you're literally watching the grass grow. Uh, this also has an, another automated uh, physical musical instrument that sort of was a, more of a collaboration between Jeff and I. I kind of told him what I wanted to I think we have, knocked it out of the day when you showed and, up. And he did, he used his mechanical skills well, to... Well, he took apart some guitars. So we yeah, so this is, there's an automated there. slide guitar uh, accompanying the grass growing. So I guess it looks more like bamboo than grass. But. And then our moving shadows, the reference to the passage of time.
one, one thing I should say that is sometimes not clear, even though we think we're explaining it well, is that all of the all of the video that you see in these pieces is always being generated live from within the sculpture. We don't ever use any. any yeah, nothing's real, recorded. I mean, sometimes we've had conversations where we will tell people that over and over again, and they say, "So who who is the videographer for the for the you know the recording?" And we're like, "No, you're not getting it." So I just want to make sure it is right. clear. Um, all, that's that's basically our whole goal is to is to make something perform live for you. Right, um, something that we can just. Somebody could push the button, set it in motion, and it performs, and it performs differently every time. So we yeah. try to work these, like, um, yeah. so ability to make choices into the pieces. The next piece is um, titled Eclipse Machine. It, it's, another, it's another piece that the big difference for me is I decided uh, I had had enough of using a lot of my um, home-baked samples and um, audio recordings that I had made, and I actually experimented with buying some commercial samples uh, of uh, orchestra in, orchestral instruments. And it was and a so, spin off from live feed because people were interested in the perpetual landscape that I made on the slice of the drum. So. Right. That was first shown. It was later converted into what you see here for a collector that wanted it in their house. Yeah. So one one of the things we tend to do is go back and forth between making these smaller, what we call collectible uh, pieces. Right. And well, the, it's fun to make the immersive environments, but yeah. So the next piece is titled "Real to Real," which is actually an immersive environment. Um, it's pro it, at it this was, point it was our most, our most ambitious thing. It's ambitious. This was about 2007, 2008. Somewhere around there. Five yep. large devices networked together, plus yeah. plus one of your installations and yeah, live so, music. Yeah, yeah, so we got live, we got live, we got basically everything that we've been doing up to this point um, packed into to one thing. And one of my favorite um, automated instruments is the record players. There's a, there's some computer controlled uh, four uh, records that you'll see. In fact, that's the first clip. So we're to start with that. that you, you can't. This piece is too big to get a real sense of it from start to finish. So we're just going to show you some of the some of the things that were in it. First is my record players. do um, that was but we basically used that as a little bit of an audio aud introduction audio introduction to the beginning of the sequence so the transformation of the, of the space and it was funny a number of people thought that's all it was going to do so they left <laughs> <laughs> I should have made it longer um, the next uh, scene we're going to show is called sunrise and I think that was Next one is the basement.
Uh, the next one is called the Sky Machine. You should talk, talk a little bit about how that was developed. Oh, well, I was just going to say, you can see that we're starting to play with narrative. Because, I mean, we weren't really taking responsibility originally, but then we started realizing that we could assemble and make hint to narrative. Not that we were telling a big yeah. story, but we could put things together enough to get you, you know, Yeah, and believing. unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see that with the, just watching these little clips. Right. But th there, there was a little bit of a... A backstory. Could there could have been a backstory that connects all of these the scenes together? Um, but why don't you? Uh, so the next clip we probably need to describe how you created the sky because oh, it was one machine. of the new so it's innovations. Re revisiting, here. revisiting the the moving sand. So I learned how to move sand by vibrating. So I came up with this way of making a believable sky or cloud pattern by making a pan tilt device with sand and vibration and then parking a little scale model diorama underneath it and watching it with the, the sky superimposed. And you, you'll see, I mean. So, the, and once he got that done, um, one thing I tried and I uh, think it worked pretty successfully is I, I wanted to have the music actually reacting to the activity of the clouds in his sky because they would go from no clouds in the sky at all to, you know, sort of storm clouds coming in. I wanted to, to do something with that and so, um, Without getting into too many details, we used some sensors and projected his his uh, sky video. And you were to producing. monitor the movement of the clouds. Yeah, so using those sensors, we kind of tried to make the music um, follow the activity Connect, level yeah. of the of the clouds. scene is what we call the barrel so this was an improvement upon Jeff's moving landscapes oh yeah and this time we wanted to make it look like it never repeated right right because usually we just have one camera just focused on, on a barrel so, so we, we had made... three cameras and it randomly picked one of them and they were constantly moving up and down on a screw as the barrel turned so I was hoping that you would have to spend a long time with the piece before you ever saw the scenery repeat itself and it was made on a 55 gallon <laughs> Understand when he shows up with things like that at my studio, they don't look like that. <laughs> He's not a visual artist. <laughs> it just looks like a board with a bunch of stuff tacked to it. So I spend a few days to make it pretty. <laughs> That's right. That's what you're good for. Um, the next uh, scene is is one of the cooler ones, really. Um, it's the I don't know what to call the scene. It's but you, you're going to see some video generated directly um, by the installation, and it features uh, one character is a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Uh, which goes back to our days of playing with music in, in high school, and a record player. And one of the interesting ideas we had to, to, to have these devices, since they typically would play music, is um, decided to actually have it play some of my music. On the side, I've always recorded, uh, for what lack of a better word, like rock music um, myself, uh, four tracks and, you know. I've got now, all this uh, albums. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so we thought, hey, well, that's, that would be a great place because uh, no one else is going to be playing these things. So, um, and it was nice because I think we picked about 14 songs, and uh, every time you would activate you know, the installation, generated an eight or nine minute sequence. So 
every time it, it, it would play a different song, so you'd literally have to watch this uh, for hours before you would see the record players. Yeah, and, and this play. was also the first time for us to use a digital crossfader, so this is technology. And oh, so yeah. we were able to do see if a little try. trickery. Yeah, we got a little magic in this one. Starts at, the magic happens at the beginning of the clip. Do you want to describe how you made the fade, fade scene? So I made two identical rooms, one with a, a table and a reel-to-reel, -reel, one with a table and not a reel-to-reel, -reel, and we just, the trouble was trying to match the wallpaper, and that's really the thing to get, I mean, if you look, you can tell what I did, but it, you're usually looking at the reel-to-reel. It's pretty good. Okay, so... I, and you also understand the scale is really small in these things. So in the early stuff, it was super tiny, like I was challenging myself, and now I'm letting myself build things bigger. So, like, the tile on the floor is, like, one-inch squares. But that record player, I mean, it's like this. I mean, it's... Uh, and when it got a piece of dust on it inside the sculpture, yeah, well, they get, it was they like a, story, like, a cotton ball flying around. Right, right. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, uh, so, so that's what, what we have for Real to Real. Um, the, the next piece is called Sky Machine Hills. We, we made a series of sky machines, what we call sky machines after this, that were a spin-off from what you saw earlier. The clouds, yeah. The, the cloud uh, scene in yeah, real to real. Yeah, I think we made four or five. So we tried to make these into a collectible piece now. And uh, next, we have a piece we called Cliffhanger. And so this was sort of a new um, attempt at taking what we would have done in our very large scale installations that created these longer video sequences. And I always thought, what if we could make one device that could do what the whole room does? Now, we didn't get there, but didn't we got it all on the same wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and it, it, it produced, uh, yeah, it's just somewhere in between a collectible piece and a large scale installation. This is the piece that was at Denver.
piece was mostly suspense. You know, I mean, even when we yeah, nothing ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was like you were at the an accident scene, but you never really yeah. It was anyway. That's why we called it cliffhanger. We just tried to use all the tricks we knew at that point. It basically yeah. had everything up until that right. point. It, it, yeah, an instrument, a sky machine. But it, it was our first use of the clock. The crossfader. Huh? But you had used clocks. I had clocks. used clocks earlier yeah. before we collaborated. Yeah, and so we'll, we'll get to uh, a, a newer piece that uses those flip clocks in a really uh, fun way. Um, the next piece, uh, we're not sure what to call it, maybe self-portrait. Oh, yeah, it's, it's really it. short. It's, um, it, 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 was, it was good because it, it, it allowed me to think about what I could do inside the scenes differently. So I actually, as subject matter, I depicted one of our installations in, in miniature. And then... So basically we, taking, taking the concept and doing it inside out. I mean, he t like, I would normally have a large automated, uh, you know... Self-playing device. Playing and then device. I might have a flat screen. And so I had to make them, but I had to fake them to make them look like they're really playing and really projecting video inside. Yeah, so. And, so, and so the little instrument that you'll see, which I mean, it's really a, it's supposed to be a large scale instrument, but it's a scale model, is, um, is actually correlated with the sound that I'm producing again. So we're sort of faking the fact that right. it's making the sound, but it-, it And then uh, I make a television out of a, a rear shadow trick, just like the very first piece we showed. Uh, yeah, so it's a short clip. That's what it looks like on the wall. And... <laughs> But it gave, it, what, what happened is when we realized that that was actually kind of an interesting thing to do, uh, Jeff started thinking, well, I want Well, I can invent things that we can't build, yeah. you know, and we can just depict them so instead it, of having to build them. So. Yeah, and so we started working on a lot of, a lot of different instruments that uh, we never would have taken the time to make full size. One of my favorites is the tuba, which you'll see uh, pretty soon. Right, and I had and, the fantasy of making an Edison recording device out of like a bicycle wheel, and it would be my uh, answering machine. Like, your machine, and uh, like, we've got some drums, and um, and uh, almost you know, almost made an accordion, but they just turned into a, a flying bellows, <laughs> flying bellows, a pair of bellows that squeeze in and out in, in outer space. And anyway, we, we as we developed those ideas, we started making this um, new large scale installation called Trailer, right. uh, which is our our uh, most ambitious large scale installation to date, I would say. What is it? Almost a ten minute. Narrative sequence when it's closer to 12, and, and then um, it's five channel video. I can't remember how many cameras are in it, it's large over number. 20, it's yeah. like 22. Um, and so, we're going to show you some of the scenes uh, from that. Um, the, the first uh, one is just a walk through, through the space so you can see what it looks like installed. It takes a lot of wires. So there's a number of instruments that are going to be performing it throughout the different scenes in, in this, and the idea at the end is all of these instruments then come together and play as the band. The band so, gets back together again. The, the room is lit by projectors only, and so I just chose to have the projector show color until the appropriate moment. So that that's that. how it starts, so we'll just let this go. The next scene is the aperture and a flower. a trailer, this is where the, the piece gets its title from, an actual Sure, if it's evident, but we uh, we grew up big fans of David Lynch films. <laughs> uh, the next um, are some drums. This is one of the instruments. And to give you an idea on scale. 
nail, those were toothpicks that I carved to make the drumsticks. Those are toothpicks that I carved to make the drumsticks. And here comes the tuba. get to see a whole lot of the actual video of the tuba, but one thing that bothers me in uh, movies when I see someone playing a violin and it's really obvious they're not actually playing the sound that you're hearing, um, that annoys me. So I, I took the time to actually um, look up all the fingerings on the tuba and make sure that every note that the tuba I played was being That's fingered correctly, that. just in case there's a tubist <laughs> looking in there. <clears throat> um, let's see, the next, uh, we like telephones and the next uh, scene is the telephone dialer. So there was a real keypad, but a fake f telephone face to make this in. And it did dial a different number for each time, every time <laughs> you uh, played this piece. Um, I think probably what we're going to do is, there's a couple more trailer scenes, but um, I think we looked at the most interesting ones. And you we're going to... Finale? We're gonna, uh, yes, we should look at that. Sorry. Um, let's see if I can get there. And that'll show um, when it turns into a five-channel video. Can you move? It's somewhere around here. So, so yeah. And in, in the, huh? I mean, it's the end of the it's the end of the bar scene. But um, we're going to see the finale of the video sequence. <laughs> about that. That wasn't exactly what we thought it was. But this is So that funny wheel was my answering machine. I think that's what I thought was going to be the lead singer because it's receiving all the voices that are being called in for all, all those yeah. dialects. <laughs> there, is, there is some kind of sick narrative behind it all, but um, you have to figure that out for yourself. Um, we're going to skip ahead now to... Uh, we did a project with Blaffer. A piece called Drip Machine, which is really, you know, we'd, ever since we'd made that, this, this ladder project, that, which actually we didn't talk about it too much, but in my yard in the early 90s, we, um, we used dripping water in that piece. And to make polyrhythmic devices. Hadn't so. revisited it. So this uh, has 20 channels of water dripping. Each um, speaker corresponds to one drip and, path. And 20 channels of audio.
I think it played like 14 different modes and ran perpetually for like three months. Yeah, um, it had a lot of different uh, types of sounds. But the challenge with that space, rings. so this goes to installation, was everything I had seen in that space up to that point, you were stopped because it's glass and it, it was inside and you were outside. So we wanted to make something that was immersive for you on the outside. So that 20 channel was directly, I mean, was put there for the viewer. So. Anyway. Yeah, and it was refreshing to get away from the installations we had been doing, which were all these video-based installations. Um, one thing we found is that it's very difficult to keep the electronics working correctly uh, in a wet environment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of technical problems with that piece. Uh, the next piece is Clockworks. Um, so we wanted to revisit this idea of using, Jeff's always kind of been obsessed with these little old flip clocks. Right. Originally I used them as um, like a Rolodex. I'd put drawings, a series of drawings on them and you could make like a flip book and I could put a motor on them and make these um, recycling, in, I mean recycling sequences and I thought ooh maybe now we can do it with better technology. Yeah, well, and so John built me a test module that had a soundtrack that would correspond with the flipping of the pages and when I saw it I was like I don't need to draw anything. This is interesting as it is. So we yeah, just so he, developed a whole installation. So, so previously he would send me some you know, awesome video of one of his instruments or a fan turning or something, and, and now he's like, just make some music. His number's going from one to 60. <laughs> so uh, uh, it turned out to be really a really uh, nice piece. I, I liked it a lot. And it's, I, it's kind of like a magic trick a little bit because you have to ask yourself, how, how could we have correlated the, the uh, sound with this crude um, mechanical thing that Jeff made? <laughs> One of the challenges for that installation was, because that was in our gallery um, in Houston, was to make it look unlike an installation. So each of those are its completely independent panel, and they were. And, but to make it look like something you'd plug in at home, there weren't, there weren't plug sockets on the wall for each one. So I had to run wires through all their walls and then put temporary plug sockets for every piece. So it actually became equally as complicated as all the wall drawings I've done in other pieces. <laughs> Okay, so we have one last piece to show us, the um, piece from last fall that we did at the Silos um, okay. Tinsel String. I think, I think that's the last piece called Diptych. And so we were invited to participate in this sh a group show at the Silos, which is this um, old uh, grain silo, cast concrete, 80 foot tall, 32, 34 cylinders. I mean, it's this crazy space to walk inside. It's like looking at the Grand Canyon straight up. And then you, then you walk into these strange inverted cones over your head and then you have these. And anyway, I thought it was really wonderful space, but I could not imagine how to make art in it. Uh, it, just, it just really baffled me. So I got measurements. I went back to my studio and I made my own object as a space that I then rebuilt inside the silos that the viewers were invited to enter in. And inside that, there was some of our devices and a personal movie theater. Yes, and so, yeah. Um, 
this piece, yeah, this it's, it doesn't have a lot of new things, so it's basically kind of a two short scenes that um, you activate when you it's, walk it's into the theater. simple, but it was maximally simple. <laughs> So there you go, to give you an idea of the scale of that, <laughs> with my dirty thumb. <laughs> that was a leftover model from trailer that sat on my shelf for years, and then finally I thought, eh, I'm gonna give it a life, so. Okay, so that, I think that's what we have to show. Um, is there, do we wanna have a question? We're up for it if there's time, yeah. Okay, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Yes. Well, I'm not being facetious, but did you did did David Bowie ever have an opportunity to see any of this? I, I don't know. He didn't call us or anything. Well, I, I, I mean, it just reminded me of something that the, the it's just so different. Yes. We like David Bowie. <laughs> yeah. Um, that kind of goes to one of the questions I was. Having as I was watching this, um, what are you? What are your sources for your ideas? Uh, you know, are they exterior? Are they interior to the work? Um, yeah, I think this the sources is really me and Jeff's relationship and our conversation over the I mean, years. This, That's this conversation started a long time ago and it just continues. I mean, this is what I was telling you earlier. Every time we work on a project, we sort of revisit a lot of the ideas we've talked about forever, but we only, we only pay attention to a little bit of it. So there's always un, like, places we haven't finished exploring. Well, do, are there things that you see in the world that you think, ah, I'm going to... Uh, you know, I mean, it's interesting. My imagery is usually stuff that's domestic and very familiar. Mm -hmm. And that makes it easier to make it believable because I can get inspired by a picture, but I know what the details are. And I don't have to give it too much detail, just enough to make it believable. And of course, I do everything in black and white because you can see the scale when there's <clears> color. <throat> and so I use it as a filter. I mean, it, at first it was just what the cameras came in, but then I was like, oh, no, I don't want because we went to color. And I was like, we got to take that away. So. <laughs> And then it gives it kind of a strange, like, antique or, or maybe a memory or some, you know, black and white does something, so, yeah. Did, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah, all your wiring is um, like a form of drawing. Uh, yeah, so I agree. Are you thinking about that when you're doing the wiring or is it they're, they're, like they're, engineering stuff? Originally, like before we did our official collaborations, when I was doing my first experiments, like, I didn't know how to, like, get one power source and use it for 10 things. So I would just have 10 power sources. And then you have that times 10. And I have so many wires, so I was trying to keep track of everything. But then I realized, because I'm a drawer, I'm a designer, and so I started making networks. And, and, and I started having fun with it. And so over the years, it's, it's kind of like the drawing I do when I'm talking on the phone and I don't think. And then you look, and I've made this whole network of lines. And so I can unconsciously wire things in a way 
that I can follow the traces, but then become a drawing. So I, I'm consciously, I think, making a drawing. You think? He, he obsesses <laughs> over it. Uh, I, I've had to sit there for hours watching him undo the wires, put them back. He's like, no, that looks stupid. And like, so it, it did start functionally, though. I mean, you, right. start, you start doing things to, so that the, the wire doesn't sag or, or I, look like it's not. Well, I, I think wall. I always thought that if it was done once, it was it, that's the way it should be. I shouldn't mess with it. But then after a while, I was like, well, I don't have to live with things that are wired, not the way I want to see them, so I'd be done. And the act can be obsessive. I, well, okay. um, yeah, this is um, a question about what this presentation can and can't do. It's it's easy to get a good sense of the scale of the objects yeah. um, from the different kinds of views we've seen of it, not just this one. Um, but it's really hard to get a sense of the uh, time scale. Yeah. of what it's like to be in there. Do, do you have documentation that's online that has a bigger chunk of stuff? Or do you, I mean, because all of these are temporary, so once they're down, they're down. Right. So and, well, we kind of learned early on that documentation, you, you can't, documentation is its own thing. There's no way it's ever going to be the same. These are small clips from our larger bank of clips. Yeah, most, of, most of our documentation on our website, um, it does show more, but it's very rare that we, we have anything that will show the whole. Well, we might have the whole sequence, like a 10 minute sequence of what the video is, but without seeing the room so you can see it. But you know, it's that's, still, it's, yeah. th there's something missing because, I mean, he even tells me when we're in a space, it, 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 it the size of the space dictates the speed of how his music is written and stuff. So, I mean, everything is so custom for the situation. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking of this more from a, a time-based music performance kind of basis, yeah. and it's just hard to tell what it ends up being as, a, this as an experience. Right. Yeah. So that's, well, hopefully, if anything, it's intriguing, the, yes. the documentation. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> No, we we agree, and I I know I know what. Uh, yeah, what it's you're so, yeah, it's hard. It's... And I think you got another one. Yeah, you're you're so has this very cinematic ambient sound, and you mentioned David Lynch. I mean, having just I just watched his Twin Peaks thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't help but see and hear some similar Lynchian yeah, things, yeah. thing, especially the black telephone. Where it's, <laughs> it's like a crime scene or whatever. That, that seemed like really. Lynchian. Well, I've definitely taken more inspiration probably over the years from films that have moved me than the art history I learned, just because it's more palpable, it's there, I'm experiencing it. And, and also, you go into a movie and you forget the time of day because you become involved in something, and that's something we want to do. Like, when you're there, you become part of our world for that period of time, and then you're like, oh, and when you leave, we're in the world still. I mean, that's what happened at the silos a bit. Wow. We created our environment. You were already in a really weird environment. The silos was weird because, you were removed from the known world when you went into the silos, but then you entered into our world too. And so it was, it was like a double whammy, yeah, whatever. Anybody else? Jeff, do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so many, huh? Well, thank you so much, guys. That was great. Thank you.